Uh, it is uh, 10 years now since we first presented introduction to probiotics right here in this facility. And since when, there has been a rather remarkable progress, both clinically and scientifically, on the subject, taking us from the simple clinical application of probiotics into the current state of fecal microbial transplantation, which is going to be the topic of our discussion today. And this is to show I have no financial connections to disclose. I will start first with a very interesting uh, case history we had recently, and then continue with a brief basic review on the essentials of probiotics, along with the very important clinical entity called dysbiosis, and then the current state of fecal transplantation as it stands today. The patient uh, is uh, a 17 years old high school student who was in an excellent state of health until about two years previously when he presents with acute onset severe diarrhea, rectal bleeding, which goes on to a progressive course. And then when he reported to us a colonoscopic examination, confirmed the diagnosis of severe universal type ulcerative colitis. Initially, there was a good response to our traditional polypharmacy comprising of mesalamine, topical steroids, and high-dose BSL. But three months later, he comes back with a severe relapse of this colitis ending up in the emergency room when he was started on high-dose steroid therapy. In the course, he was also diagnosed for a coexistent state of Clostridium difficile infection, complicating his colitis process. There was no response to steroids, and at this uh, stage, I felt that this patient would benefit from fecal transplantation, during which point the family requested a second opinion from UCSF, which we complied with. So this is the response uh, we get from UCSF with the following powerful recommendations. Strongly recommend anti-TNF therapy with Remicade in order to bring this patient into a state of remission, and also to prevent the onset of failure to thrive in this young individual who could have been in major difficulties otherwise. They also stated that they were strongly against fecal transplantation because fecal transplantation was an experimental procedure which was not established nationwide, and it should be done only at the university center within the context of a controlled clinical trial. In the meanwhile, the patient continues to remain symptomatic, and, uh, and the patient, uh, upon learning about the potential complications from Ramicade therapy, returned to my office and asked me to proceed with a fecal transplantation instead of Ramicade treatment. Under circumstances, I felt that the treatment of choice for this patient was fecal transplantation, contrary to the recommendations of the UCSF professor. And as such, we went ahead with the fecal transplantation, initially with a colonoscopic delivery, which was thereafter followed by 22 additional sessions in the form of home uh, uh, infusions through our home infusion fecal transplant protocol. And uh, remarkably, within two weeks from the initiation of the fecal transplant, not only were able to eliminate the C toxin from the stools, but the patient also became essentially symptomatic with no longer diarrhea or rectal bleeding or abdominal pain. And he actually was able to return to his normal daily activities. Four months later, we went ahead and did a colonoscopy, which revealed marked improvement of the ulcerative colitis changes, which are also accompanied by significant improvement of the histopathology. At this time, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Christine Siska, 
to show us the pathology before and after fecal transplantation therapy. So here are um, some pictures from his pretreatment uh, colonic biopsies, and there was diffuse colitis showing crypt abscess formation, basal plasmacytosis, like you typically see in the case of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, as well as crypt architectural distortion. And here is a higher power view of that crypt abscess. Um, and basically, these are neutrophils that accumulate within the crypt. Um, and you see neutrophils within the crypt epithelium itself. Um, and the following year, uh, this is his post-treatment colon biopsies. Um, you, know, you see some residual crypt architectural distortion, which is the manifestation of some you know, cr chronic underlying colitis. Um, those increased lamin-appropriate chronic inflammatory cells, but a marked decrease in the number of neutrophils or active inflammation. Um, you basically had to kind of hunt to find some, a few neutrophils within the crypts. And um, notably, we didn't see other uh, manifestations of C. diff, like exudates and that type thing. It was more of an inflammatory bowel type picture. Um, and, and in some biopsies, it was basically just quiescent colitis where no active colitis was identified. So it was a pretty, um, it was a significant improvement from the prior biopsies. Uh, thank you, Dr. Siska. Uh, the patient uh, reported to me recently for a follow-up visit when he was completely symptomatic. He has gained weight, he looked handsome, and he was on no particular medications except for high-dose probiotic formulation along with low-dose mesalamine, which we're planning to discontinue in the near future. Later last year, during the course of an IBD seminar which I attended at UCSF, when I reminded the UC professor who consulted with this case earlier in the year about the dramatic recovery of this patient after what we had done, her response to me was after a brief moment of silence, you were lucky. Now, I realize that this is an anecdotal case, but as we go along, I'm going to show you plenty of scientific evidence that will indicate that there was no luck involved here in the recovery of this patient. I prepared a glossary for you, which is in your handouts, to facilitate your understanding of probiotics uh, terminology. As I begin the scientific part of the presentation, I want to mention that the basic science behind probiotics is uh, rock solid. But although there are some very compelling favorable prospective randomized trials, most of the studies showing benefit in human disease states are uh, not prospective randomized double-blind controlled trials. That being said, our experience uh, with the dramatic benefit of probiotics in multiple diseased states over the last 10 years, let me say confidently that these benefits will persist when the prospective studies now in progress are reported. Probiotics means for life from the Greek language, and simply it is the ingestion of live bacteria by a person, providing a health benefit to the host. When we say health benefits here, we're talking about three categories, one of which is uh, preventive medicine, the other one is maintenance of an existing state of health, and the other one is the treatment of a variety of medical conditions, and including some surgical conditions as well, such as pouchitis or complicated sigmoid colon diverticulitis, which many times has been able to prevent a sigmoidectomy. Dr. Meshnikov was the first person to come up with the idea of probiotic therapy into the practice of clinical medicine. And he won a Nobel Prize in 1908 for his work in immunology, during which course he also published his book, Prolongation of Life, where he promoted his um, ideas about probiotic treatment. And this is how Meshnikov defends himself against his critics uh, who were against him because he was giving bacteria to treat uh, disorders. And what he's saying is, uh, Meshnikov, um, uh, bacteria, not necessarily all of them are bad because some of them are really necessary for us to be able to maintain our 
normal state of health, and among which there are uh, some species and strains such as lactobacilli that uh, they deserve an honorable place. Dysbiosis is a word derived from the word dysymbiosis as a hyphenation of dysbiosis, dysbiosis. It stands for an imbalance between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria, and essentially what happens is whenever there is a, uh, a qualitative and quantitative uh, disruption of the protective good bacteria, that allows the proliferation of the aggressive bacteria and thereby causing bacterial overgrowth, which leads into enterotoxin production, which consequent tissue damage and a whole host of morbidity for which Meshnikov uh, coined the term auto-intoxication. The human body contains an enormous number of bacteria, to be precise, over uh, 100 trillion, which is 10 times more than the normal human cells we have in our entire body. In other words, we are only 10% human, but we are 90% bacteria. And the probiotic flora comprises about 50% of the whole bacterial population, the other 50% being the aggressive ones. And among the probiotic ones, the dominant one is bifidobacteria, with the remainder being lactobacillus species and other kinds of uh, strains that uh, fulfill the remainder probiotic flora. One of the major functions of the probiotic uh, bacteria is the development and the priming of the immune system, and also it provides a natural defense against invading pathogens to maintain our good state of health. Prebiotics are short-chain sugar molecules that they are not digestible by the human body, but they become subject to fermentation when they reach the colon by the intestinal bacteria, which in turn produces a variety of metabolites such as short-chain fatty acids, which are important for the benefit of the host, as well as it provides the proliferation of the good bacteria furthermore. When those uh, uh, prebiotics, those chains are polymerized up to a level less than nine, they are called oligofructose, oligosaccharides, and, and, uh, such as in mother's milk, for example, or when they are up to polymerization number of 60, they are called uh, medium chain uh, oligosaccharides, the typical example of which being inulin. The human gut is not only the biggest endocrine organ in the body, but it's also the biggest immune organ in the body. We do produce more than 70% of the immune proteins ranging from IgA to IgE through the gastrointestinal tract. And this system is called GALT, gut-associated lymphatic tissue. There has been confirmation now in the past few years that there exists a crosstalk, a communication between the probiotic bacteria and the immune system in the gut, which is called molecular crosstalk. And this is done through the mediation of uh, some neurotransmitters produced by the probiotic bacteria that relays messages constantly into the immune system so that an immune response according to the body's demand can be accomplished without which, of course, morbidity will occur. And this relationship in terms of the gut immune homeostasis has been simply summarized in the form of a trilog by Dr. Quigley from Ireland. And basically what we're seeing here is, here is the probiotic gut flora controlling the immune system, and the consequence being integrity of the intestinal epithelium, tight junction, what we call. And so long this cycle is intact, human uh, health continues to remain in a steady fashion, as opposed to dysbiosis, when there is a disruption of the probiotic flora, then there will be malfunction of the immune system, which in turn is going to cause injury to the intestinal epithelium and the consequent onset of leaky gut, which is the initiating element of a whole host of morbidity. Hippocrates, more than 2,000 years ago, was right when he said all diseases begin in the gut. But then, of course, he had no way of knowing the reason why. Today, with the advent of the metagenomics, we know that the answer to this question is dysbiosis, 
because we know that through many controlled clinical trials, reversal of dysbiosis results into resolution of many diseases, among which the typical one being resolution of C. difficile infection after fecal microbial transplantation. Obviously, awareness of the cause of dysbiosis is very important, and there are many causes of dysbiosis. In the interest of time, I won't be able to mention all of them, but I'll just mention a few. One of which is the Western diet. Western diet virtually has been implicated almost in every single uh, chronic disease. And uh, this actually is not far from the truth because recent uh, scientific evidence is confirming that Western diet, which is rich in red meats, uh, rich in fat, low in fiber, excessive ordinary sugars, all of which have been shown to result into a state of dysbiosis. And dysbiosis, by causing bacterial overgrowth and enterotoxin production, is going to damage the intestinal epithelium, which results into the formation of leaky gut. Once you get leaky gut, that facilitates the, into the circulation uh, the absorption of undigested food substances, as well as a whole host of enterotoxins, such as glycotoxins or lipopolysaccharides, the outcome of which being excessive productions of AGEs, which results into oxidative tissue damage, the net result being the onset of metabolic syndrome. This is something which has been proven already, and possibly the onset of Alzheimer's disease. AGEs stand for, in short, advanced glycation end products. It represents a variety of pro-oxidant compounds. They are free oxygen radicals. And whenever their amounts goes into an excess, because let's say excessive external intake, such as in the case of Western diet, it results into a pro-inflammatory uh, setting, outcome of which being a whole host of morbidity. Another important cause of uh, dysbiosis is uh, antibiotics. Even though antibiotics are important in our daily practice, nevertheless, they come with a collateral damage. And that being, while eliminating the aggressive bacteria, it also eliminates the good bacteria and therefore becomes a cause of dysbiosis. Recent studies have clearly shown that anyone who receives a course of a single antibiotic therapy is going to end up with dysbiosis at least for eight months thereafter, subsequent to this continuation of antibiotic, which the message from that is, whenever we prescribe antibiotics on anybody, universally they should be put on probiotics, and the probiotic therapy should be continued for no less than one year thereafter. C-section is another common cause of lifelong dysbiosis, Infants uh, born by cesarean section delivery have been shown to be at increased risk of dysbiosis associated conditions such as asthma, atopic allergies, obesity, and type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Dysbiosis in C-section babies occurs due to lack of exposure to the mother's vaginal good bacteria. The baby's dysbiosis is further compounded by less breastfeeding in C-section babies and the frequent administration of antibiotics during C-section deliveries. The result is uh, congenital dysbiosis in C-section babies, making them susceptible to a whole host of other morbidities, resulting in decreased wellness during their lifespan compared to vaginal delivered babies, as well as possibly decreased longevity. Now, because dysbiosis is the common denominator in many idiopathic diseases for which we have no cure. Therefore, the analogy, the metaphor to, to, to Gordian nut is very appropriate. As many of you as you know, Gordian was an ancient city in what it is today, central Turkey. And it was famous for this nut. This was a very intricate nut that nobody was able to disentangle. When Alexander the Great, during his quest to take over the ancient world, he reaches uh, the city of Gordian, then he is confronted with this dilemma as to what to do to disentangle this intricate knot. So
So Alexander, after a few moments of hesitation, thinking outside the box, he pulls his sword, and with a single stroke, he cuts the, the nut, and the problem is solved. Similarly, this biosis, since it, 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 it holds the keys to a whole host of idiopathic diseases for which we have no cure, therefore, maybe the elimination of this biosis will be the solution of many, many diseases for which we have no solutions. Now, fatty liver disease, again, is a very common problem. And because it's so common, I picked up this particular example because it makes for a good uh, model uh, to form a prototype from which we can extrapolate uh, the course of many other diseases that may be associated with dysbiosis. For example, in this case, if you had a steak or a heavy greasy meal the night before, let me show you what would have happened to you within six hours from the time you finished this greasy meal. And this is data, very sophisticated information coming from Yale University from last year. You take the greasy food, in six hours you have a burst of dysbiosis. There's a tremendous increase in the aggressive bacteria. Your probiotic bacteria goes down. As a consequence, you get pro-inflammatory um, substances produced, and this enterotoxins injures your intestinal epithelium, from which you end up uh, uh, these toxins going into the portal vein, through which goes into the liver, and causes fat accumulation in the liver. And if you continue with this habit of eating these steaks day in, day out, the outcome is going to be progressive steatosis, eventually fatty hepatitis, and from there, development of cirrhosis and possibly hepatic cellular carcinoma. Just like fatty liver disease is a condition of dysbiosis, there are many other conditions that of, uh, dysbiosis is a major factor, such as uh, IBS, uh, IBD, uh, metabolic syndrome, a variety of autoimmune disorders, and many others. And therefore, it is very likely that elimination of dysbiosis in all these disorders is going to lead us to a cure, curative situation. Another uh, typical example of uh, dysbiosis-associated disease is irritable bowel syndrome, which has recently uh, been proven after metagenomic studies. Since dysbiosis is central to our thinking that it is very likely to represent the unifying etiology in the pathogenesis of leaky gut. Therefore, IBS is no exception. On the left of the cartoon, the IBS patient affected by dysbiosis and diminished uh, probiotic flora, who has increased gut permeability uh, caused by enterotoxin production and uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine release, goes on to develop neuromotor sensory dysfunction uh, within the enteric nervous system, translating into symptoms what we call IBS, as opposed to the normal person on the right with an intact probiotic flora and absence of dysbiosis, hence no symptoms. Recently, dysbiosis in the intestinal microbiome have been shown to be associated with autoimmune disorders. Dysbiosis-related enteritis and increased gut permeability initiates a cycle of events resulting in a state of immune response alteration, leading to the onset of a variety of immune-mediated diseases in the genetically susceptible person, ranging from chronic fatigue syndrome to celiac disease to psoriasis, to atopic allergy, among many other uh, disorders. Now, currently in use probiotic formulations, especially with high-dose BSL-3, even though have been uh, quite successful in the treatment of a variety of disorders, nonetheless, they don't even come as a close second when it comes to the efficacy of fecal transplantation because the Normal human feces represents the ultimate uh, probiotic therapy. This is uh, a cartoon 
which is depicting a variety of diseases that have been associated with, uh, with dysbiosis, for which fecal therapy has been shown to be effective. On the green asterisk, this is depicting the, uh, the, the, the disorders where uh, FMT has been successful. To show you some example, in chronic fatigue syndrome, which is an established condition of dysbiosis and leaky gut, in a study of uh, 60 patients with this disorder, after fecal transplantation, which was done only for three days in a row, there was a 70% success rate where the disease resolved itself. In another example, in multiple sclerosis patients, it has been postulated that dysbiosis and uh, consequent leaky gut leads to bacterial translocation into the bloodstream where aggressive bacteria finding their way into the central nervous system, causing uh, the immune disease uh, process. Therefore, in a small group of uh, MS patients, after uh, daily uh, fecal microbial transplantation uh, therapy for a course of two weeks, this resulted into a significant uh, clinical recovery. Now, the reason why fecal transplantation is so effective is because the stool of a healthy person contains all of the possible strains of all the probiotic bacteria found in, in the indigenous human microflora. As a consequence, the definition of fecal transplant would be the repopulation of a sick person with dysbiosis with the fecal substance obtained from a healthy host. Now, fecal transplantation has become popular recently because of the success in the control of the C. difficile infection, but in reality, there is nothing new about this. This has been around for centuries. It was first reported in China in the fourth century in the treatment of uh, severe diarrhea where the patient recovered rather quickly and as such, it was considered a medical miracle. And then again, reports from China in the 16th century where the infant feces a feces was collected and put into a soup form for which it was called yellow soup. And th that way patients were treated effectively for intractable diarrhea uh, conditions. And then we have, of course, the first report in this country by Dr. Eisman in 1958, where four severely ill patients with pseudomembranous colitis were rapidly uh, uh, recovered after uh, fecal transplantation, which in those cases was delivered through fecal enema uh, approach. The indications for fecal transplantation, one of which is unequivocal, and it is approved by the FDA, is C. difficile refractory infection. But there are other indications for fecal transplantation that range from IBD to IBS to metabolic syndrome and in the breaking of the insulin resistance, as well as other conditions such as autism, and uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, as others, as we all already have seen. Fecal transplant can be delivered by various routes, the most effective and the most physiologic one of which is colonoscopy. But then the other routes also are effective, that include the upper GI endoscopy route with placement of the fecal material into the duodenum, or passage to, through a uh, nasoduodenal tube into the jejunum as well. And of course, fecal transplant can be delivered through a fecal enema, which has been shown repeatedly to be effective in multiple trials. Across the world, fecal transplantation has been done repeatedly. As far as we know now, there are at least 600, if not higher number of cases for the purposes of C. difficile infection control and the across-the-board numbers are 90% or above. In this facility in the Concord campus of John Muir Hospital, we started and established the fecal transplant program in January of last year. Since then, we have performed 15 uh, patients with this procedure who have had C. difficile infection for an overall success rate of 93%. We have three cases in which Patients had ulcerative colitis combined with C. diff, one of whom was the young individual I presented today with a dramatic recovery, 
But the other two individuals who are much older than him in, her, in, in their 50s and 60s and had very severe colitis for more than 20 years, they failed to respond. And both of these patients had to have total colectomy. As far as the side effects of fecal transplant, so far there has been no serious side effects. Whatever we observe is uh, just transient, which includes low-grade fever, diarrhea, abdominal tension, but those last only for two, three days, and subsequently they dissolve. There have been uh, two death reports on account of fecal transplantation. Uh, however, uh, investigation into this matter led that uh, uh, none of the deaths in those cases were directly related to fecal transplant, so that was not an issue of concern. In the future, what can we expect? It will not be surprising in the next few years. We no longer will use actual feces to proceed with the fecal transplant, but rather we're going to use the isolates from the stool, which already have been done in Canada through two trials, whereby the probiotic bacteria is isolated from the stool and then either put into a capsule form and given to the patient, or the stool itself is isolated, is concentrated, and then this isolate from the stool is put into a capsule form or given to the patient, or you can take these isolates through a colonoscopy infused into the patient's colon. So either way, all of these uh, therapeutic approaches so far have been highly effective, uh, and the references for which they are underneath. Probiotics can be delivered either in the form of uh, fermented milk products such as yogurt, kefir, or lassi, or it can be given in the form of commercially available uh, compounds. Now, when it comes to commercially available products, a word of caution here will be in order because the majority of probiotics you buy from over-the-counter in the market suffer from quality and control issues because the FDA has no scrutiny on them, and therefore many of them either have dead bacteria in them, or the dosage is very low, or the diversity is not sufficient, and therefore they will not be quite effective. So when we choose a probiotic product uh, out in the market, then uh, we have to limit ourselves to brand names that have gone through peer-reviewed controlled clinical trials with proven efficacy in the human subject. By doing so, we can limit our choice of probiotic uh, uh, compounds to no more than few, among which VSL number three is uh, the best recognized. It's been around more than 10 years. It's it gone through multiple uh, controlled trials, and its efficacy has been proven. It also gives us the advantage of high-dose uh, administration, which no other probiotic can provide that. For example, by using VSL, you can use the 900 billion dosage in serious conditions, or even less than that, still 450 billion, which is a very high dose. It doesn't exist in any other probiotic available in the market. Uh, so this uh, product contains eight different kinds of different uh, species and strains, which fulfills the uh, basic notion that probiotics always should be given in the composite form. There should be multiple strain as opposed to single strain, which are less effective for obvious reasons. There are other probiotics that are effective commercially. One of them is a line, which has gone through good trials with efficacy in IBS, but it's a single strain <coughs> uh, probiotic, and its use would be limited to only to a given set of circumstances. Other uh, single strain probiotics are Lactobacillus GG, which is called Culturel, which has been effective in travelers' diarrhea, and also in C. diff colitis as well. But again, it's a single-strain probiotic, therefore its efficacy is limited. In children, a well-known probiotic is BioGaia, which is highly effective in the control of rotavirus diarrhea, uh, which comes in different formats, uh, appropriate for uh, pediatric uh, delivery. Chlorastor is a yeast probiotic, it's not a bacteria, of, and it is not part of indigenous human flora. It is effective in uh, cases of uh, uh, in uh, C. difficile colitis and also in traveler's diarrhea. But again, we have to remember that it's not part of the indigenous flora, therefore its long-term usage may be questionable, even though so far no side effects from fluorastor has been described. In this uh, facility of uh, John Muir Hospital in Concord, 
our uh, personal experience with the use of uh, probiotics has been uh, pretty effective. We have used uh, uh, the probiotic formulation in various conditions ranging from IBD to IBS, hepatic encephalopathy, and also, as I mentioned, in cases of sigmoid colon diverticulitis with a uh, high degree of efficacy. Also, we use the uh, probiotic formulation at high dose in the management of uremic syndrome with patients suffering from uh, a severe grade or severe grade of uremic uh, intox intoxemia, uh, and particularly in patients with hemodialysis as well. And in all these individuals, the GI manifestations from uremic toxin adverse effects have been brought under control by the high dose probiotics uh, delivery. We also had uh, a good response in the control of eosinophilic esophagitis with this particular formulation, a condition for which there exists no cure at this time. This is the formulation we put together over the past several years, which primarily is fermented uh, milk, which has been reinforced with a high-dose probiotic, and in this case, is going to be VSL3. And this has been furthermore reinforced with the adjunct of prebiotics, that is the oligosaccharides, to get maximal effect, for which we have used uh, uh, pomegranate and almond milk and flaxseed. And therefore, with this uh, combination, which has to be given once a day on a permanent basis, a great deal of success can be achieved. In some cases, it can be used on a BI depression if the case so indicates. The beneficial effects of uh, probiotic bacteria are species and subspecies specific, but there are many overlapping beneficial effects among the many strains, including resistance to colonization by bad bacteria, anti-cancer effect, and the prevention of leaky gut. Therefore, it is important to use many species and subspecies of probiotic bacteria, that is composite probiotics, to get the available synergistic benefits. Composite probiotics, in fact, approaches the benefit of nature's best probiotic, the normal human feces, which is more than 1,000 species of beneficial bacteria. Therefore, when a probiotic is needed, it is very important to prescribe one with as many species and subspecies of probiotic bacteria as possible, where health benefits are more readily achieved with composite uh, as opposed to single organism probiotics. Side effects of probiotics virtually are non-existent, except there are some mild side effects, such as uh, excessive gas. This usually occurs as a result of high-dose probiotics, in which case the solution is to reduce the amount to a half. Uh, but beyond that, there is no major side effect to be concerned about, uh, with the exception that when patients uh, have a severe uh, lactose intolerance, uh, in those cases, either you have to use a fermented milk product, which is lactose-free, or the addition of lactase enzyme into this particular formulation. Uh, even though no major side effects occur with probiotics, there have been some rare reports of infections in immunocompromised individuals. And that most of the time occurred because of these patients having indwelling IV catheters. And it has been found that the yeast probiotic, which was uh, the common cause in, in those situations, Saccharomyces boulardii, had traveled from the skin into the catheter and from there finding its way into the blood circulation causing the uh, bacteria, the septic condition. So uh, even though this has been a rare condition, nevertheless it have occurred, it has been reported. Because of this, whenever we administer probiotics to severely ill people, we have to take some special precautions before we deliver that, without which in those circumstances it should not be done. And this is a slide I prepared for my sarcastic, uh, skeptic uh, colleagues who did not uh, believe into probiotics uh, several years ago. There was a time when great people like Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison were ridiculed for their innovations while they were called 
idiotic ideas, and yet now we all know what happened since then. And this is a, is a remark by Bankmark from England, who was disappointed with clinicians for, uh, for uh, not pursuing the science of probiotics and not uh, following in the steps of Meshikov 100 years ago and then Eisman 50 years later, stating that the, clinician, the clinicians have not administered the inheritance well. But then in the last few years, there has been a surge among the physicians in favor of the use of probiotics, an example of which is the statement by uh, Dr. Kigler from New York, stating that with the amount of evidence we have that probiotics works and the large safety margin for them, there is no good reason not to prescribe probiotics when administering antibiotics, as I have mentioned earlier. And I'll end my uh, presentation with uh, Dr. Meshnikov, who proposed colectomy to eliminate dysbiosis and enterotoxication in his Nobel Prize winning thesis on the subject of aging. And the question is now, since the advent of the probiotics, and we know about the success rate, about the circumstances, the question will be, can we now propose fecal transplantation in order to eliminate a whole host of diseases? And before I, I close, uh, I, want, I want to express my thanks to, to, to Del Frias, our media specialist, for his expertise in the preparation of these PowerPoint slides, and also to our master librarian, Helen Dodi for her exceptional ability in the research and finding of the most difficult references that were necessary for the preparation of this presentation. And I'm going to stop here and answer some questions you might have. Thank you. <laughs>